Thanks for coming to the Huck Distinguished Lecture Series, the first one of this year. My name is Laura Weirich. I'm a co-hired faculty member between Huck and the Department of Anthropology. I'm helping organize the lecture series along with our wonderful Huck staff. And I'm incredibly excited about all of the speakers that have lined up this year. Uh, Melissa and Bailey, Melissa Bailey and other staff are helping us organize this. So I'd just like to take a moment to also thank them for all of their help. Today, Dr. Malcolm will be introduced by Penn State's own Katrina Shea, and then we will hear a fantastic talk from Dr. Malcolm that I'm really excited about. And following that, I'll moderate a question and answer session where members of the audience can either put your question in the chat, or you can use the blue raise your hand function in the participants tab. During the Q&A session, I'll either read the questions in the chat, or I'll call on you individually from the blue hand raised function uh, to give your question in person to Dr. Malcolm. So at this time, I just ask you to ensure your microphones remain muted and I will hand it over to Katrina to go ahead and do the introduction for Dr. Malcolm. Thank you, Laura. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. It is a huge pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Shirley Malcolm to you today. Dr. Malcolm is the Director of Education and Human Resources Programs at the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the world's largest general science organization. Many of you know AAAS as the publisher of the journal Science. Dr. Malcolm received her bachelor's degree at the University of Washington and her master's at UCLA, both for zoology. She was the first student to get a PhD in our, at the time, brand new ecology graduate program here at Penn State, which is very exciting to have her back because her talk coincides well with the 50th anniversary of that program. She has had an impressive career. She was an assistant professor of biology, then a program officer in science education at the National Science Foundation. She then joined AAAS, eventually leading its education, diversity and inclusion efforts for more than 30 years. Throughout her career, Dr. Malcolm's work has focused on the lack of women, especially women of color in science. She is a leader in efforts to improve accessibility of education and careers in science and engineering for girls and women. Most recently, she served as the director of AAAS's STEM Equity Achievement or Sea Change program. Her inspiring work has led to numerous honors such as the Humanitarian of the Year Award and the Public Welfare Medal, which is the highest award from the American Academy of Sciences to mention only two of many. As we are on Zoom, we cannot easily welcome her with the rousing applause she deserves. Um, but I know we are all excited to hear her talk today on reimagining the university as a place where inclusion is the norm. What will it take? So over to you, Dr. Malcolm. Thank you very much. It's good to be back, uh, even virtually. Um, and I uh, am very excited to see how many people we have. And I think that maybe this is because we are virtual and we have an opportunity to sit wherever we are and be able to, um, to engage in the kind of discussion that I hope we will be able to engage in. Uh, I want to be mindful of the time because I want us to spend time in discussion because the, the, uh, the secret sauce on what it will take is really from Penn State. It is not from me. And so I want to get us to that particular part of the discussion. Um, New lenses and new frames. Okay, uh, it, I'm at the age now where I have to go and get my glasses replaced from time to time. Not so much for the far off vision, but really so that I can read. Uh, and the, I, get a, I have to get new prescriptions and that means I have to get new glasses. Um, new ways of looking at things. Uh, I'd like to think about this, this notion of an inclusive STEM workforce as a issue of new ways of looking at the same stuff that we have been seeing all along. But the other thing that I want to introduce is that under normal circumstances, you would be trying to aim for 2020 vision, right? Well, this is 2020. And the things that we have to imagine are very different from before. 
And the 2020 vision now is really about very different kinds of problem solving. You know, Penn State, when I started to prepare this talk, I was thinking about the fact that we all evolve and so does Penn State. I mean, I, I looked at the history and it, Penn State went through a history of reimagining. Uh, if you stop and think about it, it was started as, an, as a farming school, as an ag school in 1855. I don't mind talking about the ag school. I spent my time in the ag school. That was the wonderful thing about the ecology program. It kind of allowed you to kind of roam around within the, the institution. Uh, but it was actually founded before the Morale Land Grant Act was passed in 1862. And then the curriculum expanded in 1880s, in the 1880s, to align with the land grant uh, mandate. The women were admitted in 1871, uh, but not without a lot of discussion. And I was actually writing down a lot of the words because I found that they were fascinating. Women were seen as a hazard, okay? Another set of people who were arguing about this called them distracting. Then another set said that they would threaten the standards of scholarship. So what can I say? We've always had these issues when you start talking about reimagining and changing things. Slavery ended in 1865. The first black was admitted in 1899, at least the first black that we know of, Calvin Waller. The graduate school was for, founded in 1922, and the first quote unquote colored woman was admitted in 1929. And the series of branch campuses were established in the 1930s. The first black in uh, first PhD in physics awarded to black was in 1942, as well as in chemistry, also in 1942. Now, at that point, this whole period of reimagining of the university, the question is, why then? For one thing, there was an, a changing or expanded vision. There was the opportunity with the Morale Land Grant Act. There was demand on the part of women for admissions. There was need because the branch campuses actually were established in response to the depression. And the fact that travel wasn't so easy. And so you put the institution where the people were rather than ask the people to come to where the institution was. Ambition, you want to become a research, a world-class research institution, you've got to rethink this and, and add pieces. Issues of social justice, as people were coming out and there was the availability for education, opening the space so that other people could come. And so we reach, the, we reach a point now where we say we want to reimagine the, the university. Why now? Uh, I have a friend who, uh, I don't know if it was mentioned, I'm a uh, trustee of the Heinz Endowments based in Pittsburgh. And the, my friend who's a president of the Heinz Endowments was talking about at the beginning of all of this pandemic thing, he was talking about the fact that we had to react. You just had to do what you had to do. You had to close stuff down. You had to send people home. You had to do that. Somehow we were going to have to, the next problem was how do we return? And then the third problem was how do we reinvent? And so this whole question of reinvention and reimagining is a, is a real question. It's a real issue. But in addition to the, the COVID, the pandemic, the COVID-19, during this time that we've been out, we've had a reckoning with race and racism that I never thought I'd see in my lifetime. And I've seen some real stuff in my lifetime. And it means that we really had these dual things operating at the same time, which were really putting a lot of pressure on all of our institutions to reckon, to come to some kind of a serious reckoning with where we all are and how the institutions are situated, what they do. The next thing is why now we can't go back. 
2019 is not recoverable. I mean, and I, I so the question is, it, if we go forward, what will it look like? Well, we don't know. We're all making it up as we go along. I, mean, I think that you probably realize this. As kids get sent home from school, we're making it up as to what we're doing. It gets better over time as more structure and we get into a rhythm of managing this, but we can't go back. Transformation is more possible now due to disruption. There are things that I've seen that I thought I would never see. And it was only because of disruption. And that's kind of a pattern that we've seen. If you stop and think about it, I'm not sure that women would have been given the opportunities that they that we were in the 1940s had it not been for World War II. And I see and I look at this now and the transformation allows for us to consider the, to imagine the unimaginable, uh, how we talk to people all over the world, how we are engaged in virtual instruction. If you know the faculty would never have voted for being able to go into that kind of a mode, but we didn't have a choice. So transformation is possible because of disruption. The other issue is that disparities once exposed cannot be ignored. We can't unsee George Floyd. I sometimes wish that I could, but I can't unsee that. I can't unsee the, the, the pictures of people struggling with COVID. And so that means that we've got to somehow figure out how do we respond to the things that we have seen and the things that we continue to see? Progress is often accompanied disruption. So we could imagine women taking on different roles after World War II. It is true that a period in the 1950s was a kind of go back to your homes period, but we had the experience and the history to say that women could be pilots and women could do all these other kinds of things. So we can't unsee that either. So the question then is, well, reimagine the university how? Um, one of the questions that I think is how well are the current policies, programs, processes, procedures, traditions operating in today's circumstances? How well have we adapted to a virtual environment, for example? It is true that some are, are handling it better than others, but we're all doing the best we can. But the next question is, are they working? Are all those policies and practices and procedures, are they working equally well or equitable, equitable, equitably, excuse me, for all? And I point out that the disparities have been uncovered with regard to COVID for people of color. For example, kids who went home without devices that were gonna be usable and without access to uh, Wi-Fi. And our rural populations, we discovered what that looks like when you don't have broadband. And I think that we it is uncovering the fact that we are not working, all of these things are not working well for everyone. I look at the situation for women. Women tend to be more in the role of caregiver. They tend to be more in the role of having to manage the household, which means that the schooling, et cetera. And I think about the women who are trying to somehow manage their careers and their homeschooling at the same time and you ask questions, all right? So that's hard now, but what is that gonna look like when these women are expected to put together a tenure package, okay? Is anybody gonna remember that they were juggling all of these different things? Is anybody going to re recall that it has been very difficult to get that paper in or to get that proposal in? or to all of these things that are unforgiving. And so the other thing is to somehow ask ourselves these questions about how well this is working for everybody. And then we need to articulate a vision for the future and develop plans to get from here 
to there. Because right now, people, we don't have a good roadmap. There is none, okay? So as we look into the future, and we reimagine the university, what do we see? For one thing, we see demographic changes. I know that Pennsylvania is um, about 80% white, and the rest of it is like other kinds of things. If we remove the Hispanic, I mean, if we just look at non-Hispanic whites, it's a little bit less than that even. But if we look at the age structure, okay, we understand that the young people are, are young kids of color and that somehow this university is gonna to have to figure out how it's going to adapt to changing cultures, changing populations, etc. cetera. Um, Happy Valley can be an unhappy place if, you, if it's not in fact taking into account the kind of diversity requirements and needs and cultural adjustments that will likely have to be made. The other thing that we've seen is that this has been a kind of a rough time with regard to making decisions, people from other parts of the world making a decision to come to the United States. Uh, first place, we haven't done that well handling our COVID pandemic, all right? And so would you want to come from a place that has done a better job and go into a place that seems to be off the rails? I don't think so. And so that's one question. The other question is that there have been statements that have been made by our leadership that have been unfortunate in that they have been unwelcoming. And so the question is that when people have options, are they still going to come to us, right? And so that's a major question. There is a changing narrative for higher education. Heretofore, we could talk about living, learning communities, all these wonderful kinds of things. But right now, we're asking people to pay tuition for a very different kind of an experience. And we are having people say, well, higher education isn't needed for everybody anyway. There's kind of this gathering of, of getting of a foothold into this questioning of higher education. There are little different uh, drivers for the choice of institution, not just location or program, um, uh, the strength of the program, whether or not you're offering things that you might want, but also whether or not there's a welcoming environment. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but a lot of people have. For example, that there has been an increased interest by students in HBCUs. And th looking at this, you say, well, why is this? This is this, again, this question about reckoning with race and racism. But it also is a look into the future for the university. There's an opportunity to exercise leadership. There's a, there's, there's a bright spot here. And to talk about the need to how do we move this to a point where we can help people feel welcomed and valued. So the question is, what is the vision for the institution? If I look at this for, through a lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion, what does the institution look like today? And where do I see the institution five, 10, or 15 years from now? So I'm going to look forward by looking back. And then the looking back is basically telling my own story. Uh, because uh, by all rights, you ought to wonder, how in the heck did I get to Penn State? And it's an interesting story. I was born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama. And while I was like, 50, 60 miles away from Tuscaloosa, being black and female in Birmingham in the, in, I was born in 1946. So in the 1960s, when I was getting ready to go off to college, wasn't an option, people. Therefore, this notion about looking at this narrative that kind of framed your life and where it took you is an interesting story. So, one of the things that I would say is that context matters. That is, I, was, I came of age in a period that civil rights was huge, a huge issue, and Birmingham was the epicenter of the civil rights movement. And so that meant that you had all kinds of other stuff going on. Move to, to people trying to vote 
try to get to the place where they could vote. Um, confronting um, abuse, bombings. Um, that's my grandmother and grandmother's church, by the way, and parsonage. Um, and that is a picture from the bombing of 1956, Christmas night of 1956. The other big thing that happened in 1957 was Sputnik. And that kind of blew up everybody's interest in science. And it means that science was taught or it might not have been before. And we all turned our eyes to the uh, then Soviet Union and the fact that they had stolen a march on the United States. It wasn't just about the science that was needed in order to quote unquote catch up, but it was also about the ideologies, uh, differences in ideology that were represented by that kind of an achievement. And they could make a huge propaganda thing with regard to beating the US into space. Uh, I said context matters, but you know, like you're sitting there right there at history. This is a picture of my grandmother, actually. It's fuzzy, but the woman in the blue scarf, you can't see that it's blue, but I remember it very clearly, hugging her pastor, Reverend Shuttlesworth, when she found out that he had actually lived through the bombing. And the little kid down there on the right, that's me at age 10 witnessing history and actually understanding that this was a unique place. And at 10, yeah, we got it. We, this was not a thing that you could just pass by. This was, these were things we understood. This is my elementary school. In the second half of my, of my time in elementary school, I went to Lewis School from sixth grade through eighth grade. And that's where Mr. Smoot taught me science. And that's when I really started to get interested in this. This is my high school, George Washington Carver High School. It is now an EPA Superfund site. Um, just to let you know that they built a lot of plants that put out a lot of bad stuff. And um, that was part of our lives and what we contended with. So at Carver, and when I graduated in 63, uh, there was no prom. We did, were under martial law. And that was the time of the Children's March. The, the dogs and the fire hoses, if you've ever seen that, that was Birmingham. Okay, that was my hometown. That's what was going on. And I left there and went to the University of Washington. You want to talk about culture shock? I had always gone to black schools with all black teachers, all black students. And I went to the University of Washington and I was by myself. Um, I was one, I was the only African-American zoology major out of 800 majors. So then a student saw me being halfway successful by junior year and he came into the department. Then there were two of us out of 800. But it was a major culture shock because I had never, ever been in a situation that was this different, either in terms of who taught me or who studied around me. And I, I like to think of this, the, the story, as being a story about a life course and I want to talk about the kind of problems that students even now face in terms of this life course. They choose a school. In my case, I chose a school that was way, way away in Seattle, away from Birmingham. And there's lots of reasons for that. Some is that there were schools I couldn't go to. And then that means that if I, at the time, was a pre-med major, I needed to go someplace where I had options to be able to go into a medical school. The University of Washington had a medical school. They had faculty who I thought might be able to give me recommendations and things like this. I had family in the area. I was only 16 when I graduated from high school. My parents did not want to send their 16 year old daughter off to someplace where you didn't have family. Okay, so I ended up in Seattle, Washington. Students still make these choices about where they go and where they don't. In some cases, it's because they haven't had a, a good record, or in some cases, it is because they have. In some cases, it's because they don't, in fact, want to deal with all of the other stuff besides having to study. 
And so they look for opportunities. And this is one of the cases that I mentioned before, where HBCUs are serving a fairly small uh, percentage of all the students who are out there in college, and yet they're having a very different impact on the students. And so the opportunities, the problems and barriers. So wherever you are, how can you basically learn from the institutions that are doing a good job and begin to incorporate some of the things we, we understand? Unlike when I was going in school, today you don't have to worry about building interest. The interest is there. The interest is there for women. The interest is there for students of color. And so the notion is how do we basically take advantage of that interest? So one of the things that we will often find is that students aren't, students standardized test scores don't look that good, that good. Okay, men do better than women within these groups, but it doesn't mean what you think it means. Um, women tend to do better in terms of their grades and they're more likely to complete. Their graduation rates tend to be higher, okay? So what do we make? What, what, what can we make of standardized testing? Okay, and one of the things is it depends. And one of the interesting opportunities is this COVID has basically driven a lot of institutions to drop their requirements for the ACT and the SAT. And that means you have an opportunity to talk about what it does and doesn't mean. Do the research and figure out what kinds of populations might be getting under those circumstances. With regard to admissions, the transition from high school to college is often very difficult. What you did to do well in high school is not is not going to make it in terms of what you're going to do in college. And somehow getting that information to the students as early as possible, absolutely crucial. Transfer to two from two year to four year. One of the things about Penn State is its structure allows a smoother kind of a pattern for some of that. But there's another issue too, and that is that there are these legal challenges that are occurring that are popping up right now to colleges and university admissions, especially for elite institutions or elite programs. And if you haven't seen them, they will come for your elite programs. And that is things like engineering where the numbers are small in terms of how many you could admit or computer science or things like this, you're gonna start seeing that those selectivity factors put in place. You gotta anticipate where you're likely to see the problem so that you can begin to imagine what it is that you need to do to keep from being so dependent on aspects that you know are differentially beneficial to or disadvantageous to particular groups. Variable, money matters, okay? And how the money comes matters. As this time to degree, the more things you got to make up for that you didn't get in high school, the longer your time, the more the money matters, okay? I mentioned that AAAS was doing these um, seminars based on these, uh, this work that was done by Elaine Seymour, edited by Elaine Seymour and Ann Barry Hunter, and a fantastic group of researchers talking about leaving revisited. Talking about leaving that occurred in the original book that occurred in the 1990s was totally transformative in terms of helping us to understand uh, there was a lot of problems that were our problems because they were about teaching. And they were, and we didn't come off, we, we people in STEM, we faculty in STEM didn't come off looking so well. And so the, in going back and revisiting this, we find out that we still have problems and challenges. And just so that you know, uh, we mentioned Sea Change, the Sea Change Institute, which is you'll learn about later, uh, has had four of these webinars, these web events that have featured different parts of the book. You can go, they're on, they are online. You can go and you can watch from one, two, three, and four. We have another one coming up next month. So that you, or this month, whenever, okay. So that you can begin to see and learn from what the research says about why people leave and what part of that is our responsibility um, in terms of being able to address that. So once people went enter college, so what are the barriers there? People working too many hours. I mean, you know, that, that's a major, a major challenge is intro courses that are weed out. 
with curve grading. And that's another um, aspect. I mean, I saw when I was reading, talking about Living Revisited, I saw people talking about things that they said back when I was a freshman, look to your left and look to your right, you know, about who would and would not be there at the end of this. I'm like, are you kidding me? Are they still using that trope? I mean, this is the kind of thing that we have to really focus on, looking at teaching, at poor teaching, at retention in STEM. And in some cases, even the best students leave. They'd rather switch than fight. They just don't respond to the kind of hyper-competitive environment that is presented in all too many cases. But there are all kinds of opportunities we know in things like doing research, culturally responsive pedagogy, encouragement and mentoring and building community and, and finding community and developing an esprit de corps and getting access to the things that, that we need. So graduate and medical school, for me, this was like, I, I switched in my senior year from saying I'm going to medical school to saying I'm going to graduate school. But I ended up taking the MCAT and the GRE because I, my timing in deciding to switch was not the best. But that meant that I was basically going into something I had not planned to go into. And I went to UCLA initially. And then through a bunch of whole life circumstances, I sat out a couple of years. And then when I returned to Penn State, I was able to find a community. I was able to find lots of things that I needed. I was not able to find financial support. I had to borrow money. But I was able to find a supportive environment, curriculum that made sense, lots of things that I think basically have delivered me to where I am today. So, and that is me at age 28, I think. Or was it 27? Can't remember. All right. Um, but, and those are my parents. And I owe a lot of debt to my parents, largely because they didn't understand anything about graduate school. They didn't know anything either. But they were willing to go with the flow and go where I wanted to go and to um, be supportive in general ways that I needed at that time. So the, but there was lots of, lots of challenges for most people. Uh, what is it going to take? Um, the problem, isolation is a real problem. It is a barrier. Uh, if you are by yourself, where do you find community? The lack of diversity among faculty is a problem because in my case, I had to become something I had never seen. Never. Okay. And we ended up having community in our residence halls, but nobody in my class, nobody in etc. And then you begin to make friendships and, and to find community and build community. And it's a lot more, it's a lot easier once you do that. It's a lot easier. So you've got to have mentors. That's a variable. It can go either way. If you get people who don't understand you, who don't get you, you could be there way too long. If you can get people who do understand you and who do get you and do, do um, support the work that you're trying to do and where you're trying to go. And that's, I have to basically thank my mentor at that time, the person who helped me get through that space. He happened to be a pretty young guy, he wasn't that much older than me, who was born and raised in Mississippi, white guy, born and raised in Mississippi. But that meant that he got, he do the drill, okay? And he understood where I had been and what I had gone through. And therefore, we were able to go forward together. So, how do you look at these things? I look at Meyerhoff and Millennium as pointing the way. 
all right? Um, I worked with Freeman back when he was starting Meyerhoff. I was part of his quote unquote kitchen cabinet of people who helped him think through this and another friend, Willie Pearson Jr. and, and a bunch of us trying to change the narrative, first of all, from this kind of black guys just make trouble and they're just end up in jail and blah, 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 to, you know what, these, are, these young men are men of promise and they're scholars try to change the deficit, change the viewpoint, the narrative, showing that success is possible, increasing access and inclusion in STEM education for traditionally underrepresented groups. And I think about that. I think about the, the fact that you have efforts. We've had efforts like Adita Borg. We've had efforts all over the place to try to make clear that it, that something else is different that we can get there from here okay so they point the way and we would have to see the lessons that they point us toward we have to understand what is included in these programs and what is not included in these programs and we also have to understand the notion that we or oper have to operate within the legal and judicial context of the United States. Right now, we're all sitting here with a very confusing executive order. We're sitting here with um, uh, laws that can be changed at any time, ones that we have already gone through, like Baki and Fisher, Gruder, Gratz, Fisher again, etc. We're looking at state referenda. And you're saying, well, what is it that I can do? And what can I do again? But we're all juggling all of these things to try to understand where we have to go. But at the end of the day, I, this is the question, why hasn't the needle moved? Because we've been doing stuff for years. And it has moved for some groups, for some fields. It has moved big time for women in the life sciences. We, we're, we're virtually at parity. All right. Now we're at parity in terms of numbers. We're not at parity in terms of leadership. Let's just put it out there. Let's just be honest about it. And so, but in terms of going in, being successful, doing well, and even though it was the chemistry Nobel Prize, I jumped for joy with regard to the announcement for the Nobel Prize for CRISPR. Because all of a sudden, you know, sisters are doing it for themselves. And this is like, here we are able to show what it is possible to do once we get an opportunity. But this has been the model for, the, for, for what we have been engaged in. This work was actually research that Marsha Mattis and I did. It was published by AAAS in 1991. Uh, in a volume in, ter in called Science and Engineering um, uh, at the Crossroads, okay? And we were trying to figure out, like, why hadn't we made progress? And what we found when we went to an institution is a whole bunch of programs, lots of programs. In many cases, we knew about programs inside the institution that other people in the institution didn't know about. They were isolated. They weren't kind of pulled together in some cases, they began to be pulled together. But at the end of the day, what we didn't find, what we never find, was structural reform. We never found a place where an institution had its act together in such a way that there was a firm institutional commitment where hard dollars, not grants, hard dollars, were actually spent on these things and the things that needed to be done were mainstreamed. So let's return Meyerhoff and Millennium. What's next? Okay. What is included? One of the things that is so important is what is included in those kinds of programs. We find community and esprit de corps efforts to bring students together so that they are not isolated. They're not facing this one-off kind of a thing financial aid, they shouldn't have to wonder 
where your money is going to come from when you're trying to already do these hard things and for sure you don't need students working 40 hours and then trying to do their work at the same time that's not going to end well tutoring and support not only external but with each other building peer connections career counseling having somebody to answer the question what am i going to do with this stuff and providing research experiences all along like that is answers the question what am i going to do with this stuff and why is this stuff important and what does it mean and especially now when we're sitting in a in a pandemic and you want to make a contribution toward the sustainable development goals and addressing the pandemic and dealing with climate change and all these other kinds of things that's the opportunity we want okay what is not addressed by programs like Meyerhoff and Millennium campus culture it's still operating as an island or a bubble as it were with a campus culture that may not be necessarily supportive existing intervention programs that may or may not connect in meaningful ways or inform in meaningful ways or learn from in meaningful ways avoid how to avoid the legal and judicial challenges while providing what's needed addressing faculty cultures barriers that are baked into the system that we just never question the tenure clock we never question it you know and and, and yet there it sits and we never question the issue of how we're going to sustain all of these kinds of programs. The programs are expensive because they are operating on top of an existing set of structures that they are meant to try to overcome. And so you're only going to do this by going radical, transformation. And that's why I've gone radical in terms of sea change to provide scaffolding for institutions that can guide and support context-specific voluntary change. Nobody's telling you to do this, but in alignment with your own mission that can result in systemic transformation in STEM. And I, I think that this is where we are, and I think that this is what we've been waiting for, some kind of a way to figure out how to make all this stuff normative, how to make it the regular way that work is done. The policies are the policies that work for everyone. The processes are processes that work for everyone. And you have thought your way through it in such a way that you know who it might disadvantage if, in fact, you stay on this course. And I think that is an absolutely crucial aspect. And that it is sensitive to, in our case, we look at issues that relate to women. All, of all groups and we and as well as um, African American, Latinx, Indigenous, and uh, other minoritized populations of men. And we don't pick up other things, even though we, in our principles, we think that we've got to be attentive to first gen and LGBTQ and all these other things because we're metrics driven. And most institutions can't give us the metrics with regard to those populations and so we have to stick with where we can count because it's absolutely critical that we know that we understand how this actually works who's there and who's not and I think that that is a, a, a fundamental uh, issue that we all have to do sea change is a program for continuous improvement and it consists of three aspects community, the institute where we build capacity, introduce people to the latest research, etc., and the award structure. And most people have heard about the award structure. We have adapted this from the Athena Swan program within the UK. Uh, we have, however, they have a separate gender equality and race equality project. We put it together because we are attentive to the fact that women of color tend to get the worst indicators of anybody in terms of hiring rates, no numbers, salary inequities, likelihood of harassment, et cetera. So we are very intentional with regard to intersectionalities. 
And our theory of change really is that we need top down and bottom up. We need leadership to commit on the one hand, but we need departments and faculty and what have you to commit as well. Because a lot of the things that need changing are situated in the department, in the units, okay? Yes, there are things changing that are situated in the overall institution. Those need to be changed too. And I think that the question of top down and bottom up is really a very, very important issue. We are working with disciplinary societies right now that they are coming together as collaborators to try to figure out how to develop criteria that relate to a field. And so while we're working there, we are working top down with the institution. So we have an award structure just like you would with LEAD or other kinds of things. <clears throat> you get a, you can get a bronze award if you uh, do a thorough self-assessment using qualitative and quantitative data. You identify the key issues and that's only accomplished through reflection. You basically have to own your problems and you have to call them out and then propose actions that would be put in place to address the key issues and move the institution forward. Silver, so that gets you a bronze. Silver, you've got to basically show that you've had impact on those things that you've called out. And that's why this notion of continuous improvement and iterating toward where you want to be is so crucial. And in terms of goal, that means that not only you do everything for silver, but that you serve as a beacon for other institutions to where they want to go and what they want to be. We've seen these, <laughs> these lines looking at what has happened to women in many different fields. We've seen great change in medical science, great change in law school, great change even in the physical sciences, but that's largely driven by chemistry not by physics. And then we see computer science and there is an object lesson in computer science people. Things don't stay fixed. Okay. The lesson there is that you must be forever vigilant and you must adopt a notion of continuous improvement. So what next? We've got to move away from this notion of depending on individual characteristics. I, yeah, I'm willing to admit I've been awfully resilient and I would basically say, yeah, I have a lot of grit and I've been a survivor. Okay. But not everybody is, we can't make these numbers move by making everybody have more grit. We basically have to accept the institutional responsibilities to provide pathways, ramp weights, guidance, navigational goals. Interventions are not enough. These are systems problems. Thank you, ecology. That really taught me that. It's a systems problems and you cannot, in fact, solve systems problems without taking systems approaches. And so we have to look at this in a way that reimagining basically goes through a systems approach. And that is the lesson that I leave for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Malcolm, for that amazing, very inspiring talk. I would like to move us into the question and answer session. Um, if anyone has a question, please feel free to either raise your hand using the blue raise your hand function in the participants tab, um, or please feel free to put it in the chat. To get us started, I know that Katrina has a question for Dr. Malcolm, and so I'll let her go ahead and go first. Oh, thank you very much. That was a great talk. Thank you very much, Dr. Malcolm. Um, when I was on sabbatical in Australia, Athena Swan had just been trialed, and I talked to Sage. Someone... Yes, yes. And I was just talking to someone who was very instrumental at the University of West Australia in getting it adopted, and she said what happened there was there were some casual adoption by several institutions that were interested, but it was pretty low scale. And then someone in the Medical Research Council went, 
you're not getting funding unless you're part of this. And then every institution across yes. the country participated. Yes. Can you see something that we could do here with NIH, NSF, that would allow that immense rapid pivot to um, something more general? Do you Pat, from you your lips to God's ears. Oh. <laughs> I, it, 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 I, I don't see that happening right now. Okay, we are in a political time that is unlikely to happen. Okay, uh, what I have been actually talking to some of my private funder friends, however, is you know, there's nothing to keep you from doing that. There's nothing to keep you from saying, I want to see what your diversity num numbers look like. I want to see what you have committed to this. The other part of it is, and I, and I will offer this to you. Um, after the George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and every, every other bad thing that happened, um, you had a lot of institutions that stepped back for a moment and said, wait a minute, we got a problem. And they made statements about how much they deplored it and decried it, et cetera. And a lot of their students and faculty and some of their staffs stood up and said, it's fine for you to say that you didn't like it. Now, what are you going to do? Okay. So in the face of that, we have sent letters in many cases to institutions that we've had some contact with before and said, here's an opportunity to do something. And that is to stand up and at least join as a member. You don't have to go through the awards process yet, but you come on board and you start to engage with other institutions that are striving and still trying to deal with the same problems that you're dealing with. And we do, and now we basically have charter members and we uh, do briefings for them. Um, we find out what is bugging them, what's on their minds. Uh, we have one coming up soon that's going to focus on the executive order and what it does and does not mean for them. So being able to get access to that kind of, those kinds of updates is very valuable for an institution and especially to know that you are not doing that by yourself. You're basically trying to get in there and do it with others that are struggling with some of the same issues. So while I'm not holding my breath for NIH and NSF to suddenly say that we're going to do, go in this direction, private foundations, private funders, that's, that is a possibility. Private donors, that's another possibility. And quite importantly, the notion of pressure that comes from faculty and students to do something that on top of everything else that is going on in the world, I think that that, that <laughs> this is a matter of this disruption offering opportunity. I see some questions in chat. We'll take one chat question and then we'll move to an in-person question. Uh, the first chat question is, how can we best welcome people who don't look like us into mentor-mentee relationships? Did that come through, Shirley? I froze. Oh, sorry. I'm just glad that I didn't freeze through the presentation. All of a sudden I froze. I couldn't hear anything. But in any case, you want to repeat that? Sure. Thanks, Shirley. Um, how can we best welcome people who don't look like us into mentor-mentee relationships? Oh, my. Um, it, all you have to do is encourage people. Uh, ask, listen to people. Let them tell you their story. Their story often tells you a lot about what you need to do for them and how you can help them and support them. And I, you know, I mean, think about what I went through when I went to the University of Washington. I mean, we lived in separate worlds and yet everybody in my class was white. My roommate was white, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we kept talking to each other until we found whatever we had in common. And I, I think that in many cases it's a matter of being open, welcoming, and listening, and you'll find it. 
Great. Our next question comes from Sterling Wright, who has raised his hand in person. Sterling, do you want to unmute and ask your question, please? Oh, Dr. Dr. Malcolm, I just um, had a question about, like, our try, I want to see your insights about standardized testing, because I was, I was, I used to be a high school biology teacher, and so um, my performance as a, like, an educator was determined or assessed based on my students' performance on the standardized test. Um, but like to me, it's just I'm not sure. Like, should we put more efforts into students performing better on tests, even though we know like um, there's a lot of flaws in that? And also, like in my experience, like just teaching to a test drives students away from STEM because they get tired of worksheets and just answering. I mean, like, right. because they, there's no there's no joy in just right. regurgitating right. information. You're absolutely right, and that's and so, what. Like, like, yeah, sorry. Yeah, and just no. Go ahead. Yeah, you're your thoughts and like, should we put more efforts into students like elevating, like especially like the backgrounds you're talking about, increasing the standardized tests or should we be like putting our efforts into something else? I think that the greatest effort that you can put into is finding out what question, what biology questions they have that affect their lives. Okay. Because they are likely to put forth a lot more effort for you and you mm -hmm. then something that is just irrelevant, okay? Like right now, I'm fascinated by, uh, I've gotten fascinated by the kind of public health issues that relate to the kind of toxic environment that my high school is situated in now. Because when I started looking at the public health data, what I found out was that you, you, you start looking at the, the impact on the body of heavy metals, the impact on the body of this or that or that. And what people tend to, what you tend to see is that they look at like things called excess deaths, but they look at them one at a time. And I, it doesn't make sense to me. I said to somebody, but people are living in the soup. They're not experiencing this one toxic <laughs> item at a time. So beginning to help students understand how a lot of the things that we are trying to teach them are actually related to issues that are immediately relevant to themselves and their communities is a real good way of, of engaging. And you're right, the tests are mindless. But the question is, I, Lauren Resnick once said, we tend to value what we can measure rather than measure what we value. What is it that we really value? We value the way that they think about the concepts. We value whether or not they have, they identify where these, what kinds of questions these concepts can actually answer. So I think that we've got to kind of really rethink all of this and as we move forward. And yeah, just to that point, especially, I mean, I know with COVID has changed things somewhat, but I mean, a lot of scholarships and universities still look at students' transcripts and um, like how they perform in those standardized tests. And, I know, I know. So it's, it's very- But they, ought to, they have to ask, they need to ask for the essays. They right. need to say, what challenge did you face that you overcame? They need to start asking for things that can tell you if these individuals are mentally tough, if what you, they've got to give context to that transcript. That transcript without context tells you nothing, okay? I had one student one time, I was on a panel to judge somebody for a high level scholarship and I found out that he, his apartment had, had burned down. And so that for like a couple of weeks, he didn't have notes you know, so when did that happen? Well, at the in the term that he got lower grades. Well, do I look at his grade point average or do I look at what he had to overcome? So I'm just saying that we need to be able to provide opportunities for contextualizing these kinds of things. Thank you so much. Okay, we have another question in the chat. Can tenure systems be a barrier to change? In other words, are there deep changes to academia required at this moment to work towards equity and inclusion? Yes. Most crucial to you. Yes, 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 yes. Um, 
you realize, of course, that, that no matter what people have said, that tenure has basically been driven by publications and grants and not so much by teaching or by mentoring or by supporting who you support about or about working in community. I think that somehow we've got to have some different kinds of discussions about what all of this means. Um, I, I don't think that because we've always done, done it this way is a good answer to the question, why do we continue to do it? And yet it's a, it's a hard question to have because it needs to be a question among full, full professors. They're going to say, of course, the associates and the assistants are going, to, are going to say something different. But I think that at the end of the day, the people who are supposed to be providing leadership for the field, not just for the department, for the field, have got to step, and say, step up and say, is this really the best we can do? And I, I think that that is what I ask everybody to put on a different kinds of glasses, look, put different lenses on and ask, is this the best we can do to kind of recreate the past? Imagining the future requires you to value different things and to express those values in ways that turn into decisions about faculty, decisions about resources, decisions about, about tenure, etc. And I, I just think that if you would look at those that in a different kind of a way, what are the, what are the needs of our department? Not the individual. What is the needs of the unit? And how are different people contributing to that portfolio? Think of it as a portfolio of needs for, the, for a unit, okay? And think of it as who is doing what to fill in this palette that we have here. And then you will begin to, I think, value what people are bringing in a lot, of, in very different kinds of ways. That. I realize we're after time, but I'm going to keep going on the questions because there's so many um, great important things I think to be discussed here, as long as that's okay with you, Dr. Malcolm. Just uh, keep going. Great. I, I we have, could, uh, we'll cut it off when I have to cook. <laughs> I have a concern, which is that we do not recognize our own prejudices the nature of our own prejudices, that we don't just say support our students, that's patronizing. That's not recognizing what is really our own, what we bring, the prejudices we bring to, and, and it, it's the patronization that I, I really, object to. I totally agree with you. You know, one of the things that I have found um, is that faculty often forget what they were like when they were the ages of our students. Okay. Or that what like were you like at 17? What did you know? What did you understand? And the, in many cases, they make judgments without thinking about the lenses of the students, just looking through the lenses that they bring as they are now. And I, I do have a problem with that. You know, I got a friend, I got an article from a friend who studies um, prejudice and the origins of prejudice. And he found prejudice 
among preschoolers attending to nonverbal cues from the adults around them. Now, that's frightening. That's frightening because it wasn't just about an individual. It was also about generalizing to groups that look like that individual. So, you, I mean, you're right, it's patronizing and it is basically, it isn't really clear that people understand what they're even doing. And I think that this is a kind of a lack of, of mindfulness. I think a part of it is kind of a fixed mindset view of our students that they come to us either able to do it or not, as opposed to they come to us with a lot of potential and we have to develop it. I do not look like the person I was when I left Carver High School. I was smart, but I was underprepared. And I had a lot of problems, especially in chemistry lab. I mean, I had all kinds of problems and I almost failed it, okay? But some number of years later, I. As, I don't know if you've ever heard people say that, to kids that he grew into his body. Okay, I, so I, it's like we're growing into ourselves, and but you've got to be supported and helped to do that. There is also the other thing that I concern me, that when we institute changes, we ought to have some way of assessing whether it is achieving its goals or not. Yes. Sometimes what we do actually reinforces prejudice. You're right. But in this particular case, one of the things that I argue for is within sea change, and that is to actually data, 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 metrics, 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 qualitative climate change surveys. Are some people experiencing this place different from other people? If so, why? Focus groups. I mean, we're not, if we're not willing to ask the questions, we're not going to find out where the problems are. And that's, I think, where we've gone wrong in so many different cases. And we've got to keep coming back and remeasuring and reassessing and re reflecting to see whether or not we've made any positive difference. Great, thank you so much for those questions. We have um, quite a few in the chat and then we have some people backed up um, in person as well. Uh, the question on the chat is, in my own equity work, when thinking about institutional change, there's so much fear or perceived risk in making structural change from leadership. How have you been successful in getting leadership from who are fearful to commit? Right now, that's where the disruption helps you, okay? Because quite frankly, there is more danger in not changing. Right now, there is more danger in not changing. And in fact, if you can get people to understand this, that there is that you've got to look at relative risk. And so the, I think that trying to lay out that the institutions, basically the higher education is at an existential moment. I mean, I chair a finance committee for one of the boards that I serve on, one of the higher education boards. The budgets are gruesome. And given what is happening with regard to the state governments, it is it is not going to get better. It's going to get worse. And so having to rethink everything is a good idea. Because if you keep going, if you keep doing what you've always done, you're going to keep getting what you always got and therefore rethinking. It is now the time to rethink. Great, thanks for that. Uh, next question we'll have from Ciela, who's in person. If you could unmute yourself and ask your question, that would be great. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Malcolm. Thank you very much for your lecture. Wonderful presentation and so many ideas and thoughts. Um, thanks for sharing. My question is about uh, women representation in leadership in leadership. yes you, as you mentioned we have uh, made a lot of progress 
in recruiting and retaining women in STEM. And actually, I did a very quick um, tally here of more than about, uh, you know, two thirds of the represented women in this lecture today. I mean, the, the, the uh, participants were women. So we know and we know what's going on and we're interested, we're learning. But still, you're saying we're not doing well. Yep. What do you think needs to happen to change that? Well, you first thing you have to do is identify it as a problem. Somebody has to own that as a problem because there are lots of strategies that have come through our experiences with advance, for example, and other kinds of programs that tell us how we can begin to address some of this. Um, as I look at the numbers, women suffer from the quote unquote, always the bridesmaid, never the bride or maybe I should say never the groom. The point is that um, uh, they're often associate this or assistant that or deputy the other, but they don't in fact get recognized in terms of the next level. And I've seen women, I mean, we've had our own strategies. I've seen women go and get additional degrees or additional trainings. I've seen them go and add an MBA or add of this or add of that. And I say, I call that hyper-credentialing, okay? We want to be able to put in all those letters and all that other certification there so somebody can't say, well, you can't do, you don't know how to do budgeting or you don't know how to do strategic planning or you don't know how to do this or that or the other, whatever other excuse that is put forward as to why you won't move into a leadership role. And I think that it, it, in many cases, it, we've seen it as our problem to solve, but it's not our problem to solve. It is that if anybody, if an institution is smart enough, is smart enough to want to take advantage of the talent that is out there, what they would do is to begin to offer stretch assignments for people to gain those skills, offer them mentors who have those skills so that they can acquire them. And then to, in fact, be able to move people into those next level positions. But I think that that is, um, that's on us as, a, as institutions that, that, that's a dumb move. It's a dumb move to basically leave your good players on the bench. It is just not smart. I'm sorry, I'm into football. I just think that, okay. In some cases, you know, it's only when our quarterback, quarterback breaks his leg that we can bring the person in from off the bench to actually see that we can still play in the game. But it shouldn't be that way. We should think about the opportunities that are out there. On the other hand, we women should encourage each other to apply to things and we need to nominate each other for stuff, okay? I have called up women and say, you know, have you applied for this? If you do, I'll give you a letter of recommendation. And they, well, I didn't think. Well, but you're bringing all the skill sets. And it's basically because we have basically been put down for so long that we are all walking around with imposter syndrome. And, you know, that is whatever it is. But we've basically been made to think like that, to think that we don't bring in the skills. And we just got to get it out of our heads. We are good and we are ready to lead. And I am ready to have us lead because quite frankly, we can't mess up any more than the people who've been leading. Thanks for that. That's another question in the chat. If an institution only had the resources to implement one systemic change this year, what change would you recommend? That's the thing about a system, okay? That's the thing about a system, and that is that anywhere you start, if you're committed to the system, you're going to end up dealing with the whole thing. So which one is the most urgent right now? But don't just take that one on. 
don't just commit to that one. Commit to doing the rest of it because, quite frankly, they're going to come back and bite you in the you-know-what if you don't. You bring in students, but you don't worry about making a, the environment safe and, and, and welcoming. You won't have them long, okay? That will affect retention. That affects budget. That affects lots of other things. You bring in faculty, all right? You don't worry about the climate that they're entering. You won't have them long. You will have paid for their 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 setup, their startup cost, and you will never reach the benefits because you put them into a toxic environment. You know, there's an old blues song. I mean, you you are all too young to know it. It's called "It's Cheaper to Keep Her." But the it, in those notions, retention, retaining people, and offering them a good environment in which they can flourish is a much better strategy. But if you try to deal with this thing without dealing with these, others, th these other things, it's not going to work. So you need to at least have a st systemic vision for what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Thanks for that, Dr. Malcolm. Another question from the chat. In pursuing equity in higher education, what challenges have you seen for people with disabilities or who might be neurodivergent? How might your work be applied to or include these communities as well? Oh, well, the thing is at AAAS, we've had strong projects for persons with disabilities. And so um, that is something that I, in fact, do know something about. And that is that in many cases, we just, don't accept the fact that in, that people with disabilities often know better than anybody else what they need in order to be successful. And we have to give them the opportunity to say that, what those things are that they need. Um, often there are the, the, the questions of being able to not just access buildings, although that used to be an issue, but it is to access labs, to access programs, to access um, a welcoming environment. Because uh, you know, and I told you about how the women were co called a hazard and distracting, et cetera. They, they, people say those same things about people with disabilities. And that means whether, they are di whether the disabilities are, um, are apparent or non-apparent, you are still, th there's still an opportunity to help people basically deal with what their issues are. If you can basically establish trust to have them tell you what their issues are and therefore what you need to do to support their success. Great, thanks for that, Dr. Malcolm. Um, the next question is regarding mentoring. Have you seen any interesting success from organized mentoring programs for either students or faculty at large public universities? If done well, is this one good way forward? Well, I mean, we've seen a lot of examples of mentoring programs. Um, it, it, the notion of, for example, getting a mentor who is not in your department, somebody who's not going to be judging you in terms of tenure getting people who can tell you what the real deal is and how you can begin to navigate the system. I mean, I wish the system were different, but it is what it is. And therefore, you need to know what you're dealing with. And so uh, I've seen uh, peer mentoring, not just people at a different level, but people who have overcome things uh, within their particular group. My feeling is that oftentimes just getting together and having lunch and talking about how to overcome things and what I have experienced and how I might have managed it, it, it keeps things from blowing up. And oftentimes the things that blow up, blow up because they didn't get taken care of when they were small. And I think that it's important that people know what their rights are, what their opportunities are, and that they, um, that we not look for a magic something or another. 
to solve this problem. We ought to be able to expect civility and support from the people who are around us. We ought to be able to expect community and somehow building into a space so that that community is possible. I think that's really, that ought to be a part of that vision that it gets put out there so that we can aspire to move in that direction. And if that is not a part of, the, of that uh, vision right now, what is it that hampers it? Is it, uh, is it a message that if, that for me to win, you have to lose? Or is it a message that we're all in this together and that we could move forward together? I have, I, I think that we've got to think about the messaging that is basically coming out of our programs and out of our departments and out of our units about what is the, what are the benefits and the disadvantages that or perceived disadvantages of collaboration. I could perceive nothing but advantages because quite frankly, that's where knowledge is going. It's going into the inter spaces and the, and you're not going to necessarily know how to do all this stuff. And so the idea of reaching out and working together and what have you, I mean, you may think of it as a kumbaya moment, but I think of it as really a way of learning new things, of building relationships and um, of bringing joy. I loved that idea of joy, bringing joy into our professional lives. Thank you, Dr. Malcolm. Uh, we have another question from the chat and I'll, I'll try to make it snappy. Um, it's a lengthy question. Anyway, it's about dropping the GRE requirement for graduate schools. Are you seeing this trend at other at universities and do you foresee a point where the GRE's use as an admissions requirement will become obsolete? And if so, do you see students of color and from underrepresented backgrounds opting not to even bother applying to programs that continue to use it? Okay. All right. There are multiple parts to that question. It's a okay. big question. <laughs> I am seeing a lot of institutions right now at least not require the GRE. Okay. Departments in many cases are still requiring the GRE. So a department needs to ask itself, why are we still requiring this? What is the information that we expect to get from this that we don't get from grades, recommendations, any research that people have done, et cetera, et cetera. You know, are we trying to calibrate what this all means? I think that the, the idea that in a very short time span, we want people to perform on a test that has little predictive value in terms of what they're going to do as a researcher. <laughs> I mean, I'm just Saturday morning or when, whenever I know they do something like that. Anyway. Okay. Or are you going to instead draw on what they have been doing for four years? All right, or five years, or before then. What you know? Are you go? Are you going to believe the stuff from one small slice of time, or this longer slice of time? How did they handle challenging material? How did they overcome obstacles? You know. So I think that that that's a fundamental question. I want you, if you can get a chance, some of you to read some of the materials that Kayvon Stassen has written about the GREs, where he's talked about, uh, Kayvon is at uh, Vanderbilt. He managed the Fisk Vanderbilt program that um, uh, is a bridge program into Vanderbilt's uh, astronomy, astrophysics program and looking at the students that he brought that have come through that program and his notion about the GRE. So they replaced this with like interviews with students. You know, you can Zoom call somebody for 30 minutes, and talk to them, get a real good sense about the students. So the faculty at the time didn't necessarily want to do that, you know, because we, they weren't Zoom calling at the time, they were actually call calling. And he says, well, 
30 minutes, $100,000. 30 minutes, $100,000. Which would you, what do you think the bargain is there? Because you can tell a lot about a student when you spend 30 minutes just asking questions and talking with them, all right? And quite frankly, with you, if a student, the, many of these students that we're talking about, when they have to pay for the GRE multiple times to try to get their scores up, and that's what they do. I don't know how much GRE costs right now, but if you can imagine a student that already don't, doesn't have a lot of money, taking the GRE three, four times to try to bump up their scores. Now, if I were a student under those kinds of circumstances, feeling the pressure of needing to bump my scores up, guess what? My working memory would be shot to hell. I wouldn't, I'd go in there, I wouldn't do very well at all. And that's, and so there you go. So I think that we've got to think through what, what did we use the GRE for? Do we use it to sort people, to weed people out? Does it, what does it tell us in terms of whether this person is going to perform well as a researcher? What is, what is kind of the predictive value for us? So. I, here, the COVID provides another opportunity to do the experiment, okay? Do the experiment. Look at people who came in without the GRE. Look at the ones who came out in, in earlier classes with the GRE. What is it that I can tell about the performance or the knowledge, et cetera, of those students? Do the experiment. Wonderful, thanks for that, Dr. Milgram. I think we are finally out of questions and we are approaching 5.30. <laughs> so it's and I have to go cook. <laughs> and you have to go cook. Um, so I just, on behalf of the Huck and, and everyone who is here today, I wanna to say thank you so much for an absolutely fabulous, inspiring talk. We are very grateful for your time and, and energy today. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Malcolm. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks Thank to everybody who came. For those of you who are still on the line, the next talk is November 17th at noon. Please note the time change to accommodate an international speaker. I hope to see all of you there. Until then, be healthy and be well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shirley. That was absolutely- I'm just reading my chats. I, <laughs> I just wanted to say, there's so many wonderful, positive Thank things in the chats to say thank you. Yeah, it's well worth reading. There's some lovely messages. Oh, this is cool. I'm learning all kinds of stuff in the chat. <laughs> well, I think there's a way to download the chat. Do you know if you so, can Yeah, so I, I'll, I've recorded the whole lecture um, and that will include the chats. And so I can actually email you a text file of all the chats if you'd like, Shirley. Okay, all right, bye. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Katrina. Oh, well, thank you so much, Laura. Laura. Amy, I'm so glad you could come too. That was great. No, it was Laura, good. thank you for organizing. Thank you. And I thought she was extremely kind to mention our program. Yeah, you know, we got like a slide, like what? So, yeah, so I got kind of comments back from students like, hey, wait a minute, that's us. So, um, <laughs> yeah, she was on. We were on quite early, and she was talking about. I think she meant Chuck, or when it was being set up. And yes. she was like, "If you don't do it now, you're never going to do it. Just do it. You don't need to have right. all the money set up." Right. I, I think that's who she meant. Um, but I, I, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. That's good. Well, well thank you for all your work. I appreciate it. Yeah, Laura. Thanks for moderating that. That's always challenging. Oh. Yeah. yeah. No problem. Thanks for having such a great invitee. She was. And then, Amy, for those students that, and for the future of the program, of course, um, this recording then you can use. I, um, she's happy with that being passed on for posterity, right, Laura? Absolutely. So it's available yeah. for people who come in the future or who couldn't sure. participate because of class clashes. So we'll just forward us a link and it's all good. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Take care. Okay. All right. Thank you again, Laura. Bye, Amy. Thanks, everybody. Bye.